Welcome to a personal interview conducted by Addison Lucy of Signa Schrader. My first name is Signa, S-I-G-N-E, but it looks like Signe, which is what most people call me. My last name is Schrader, and that is hard because that's S-C-H-R-O-E-D-E-R, and they say Schroeder or Schroeder or, you know, never Sh Schrader, so it is Schrader. Okay, the first question I'm going to ask you is, uh, can you describe Mary Sawyer for me? Uh, I can describe what I remember about Mary E. Sawyer. Because you see, she, was, she died in 1941, and I was just in about seventh grade. And I didn't ever really know her as a person. But I have seen a picture of her, which I couldn't find. But Mary, we called her Estelle, Mary Estelle, Mary E. Sawyer. We called her Mary Estelle or Estelle. And um, she was a, not a small woman, but a slight woman. Um, and when I knew her, she had um, darkish brown hair um, flecked with gray which she wore in a flat braid around her head, which was, it didn't stick out like braids do, but it went flat and it was wide. So it wasn't very thick, but it was very wide. And she put that around her head and pinned it in with old fashioned hairpins. This is a, probably 1940 or 38 that I remember this. And over that she wore a hairnet which you don't even see anymore, but it's very light netting and it matches your hair, so you're not supposed to see it. But it holds it all in place. And those are the days when women had long hair, or she did, and she wrapped this stuff around her head. And um, she was wearing, I can remember to this day what she was wearing, she was having lunch or something at my grandmother's house. And I was brought in to specially meet her because she was my godmother. And um, so I went up and I believe I probably curtsied because we, were, we learned how to curtsy to older people in those days. So I probably had a little bend in the curtsy and um, she shook my hand. We didn't hug in those days, we just, she just shook my hand. And that was my godmother. So how old were you? Well, I'm thinking time? if I'm about in, um, see, she died in 1941. And this is probably 1937 mm -hmm. or so. So I was just a young teenager, I'd say. 12, 13. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I forgot. I just <laughs> lost it. Uh, can you name some of her accomplishments she did? That's uh, her main, most wonderful accomplishment was to give her fortune to uh, the city of La Crosse for Mary E. Sawyer Auditorium. The auditorium they built was, is no longer. They built that after 1941. But um, it has her name still is on the big center auditorium downtown. And she gave $600,000 in those days. That was a lot of money. And she gave her entire fortune, except for some money she gave to, keep, to help her brother live for two more years. So that was, that was her main thing that she did. Uh, can you explain how times were different back then for women? Well, that's a big subject. Um, <laughs> um, one thing we know about Mary Sawyer was that she was uh, a part of a movement of women in La Crosse in about the um, 18, late 1800s. And she was part of a group that called themselves the Women's Exchange. And it meant that women you see, they didn't earn money, they didn't go out to work, they, didn't, they stayed home and and a lot of them had some time on their hands, so um, they started to do things with their hands. They created things. Maybe they painted, maybe they, um, they could have done anything. Now Mary Sawyer was very clever with her hands, 
and did a certain amount of needlework. And she was well known for her tatting, and I brought some of that along because I thought no one nowadays knows what tatting is. And that is this stuff here. I'll show you that. And you do it in a long string like that with a little tiny, tiny needle, uh, kind of like a crochet hook, and you, you anchor one end on a pillow or a certain, um, yes, it's sort of like a pillow, and you pull the tatting toward you, and I think you begin to just do these little itty bitty stitches on black velvet, so you can see it with a light coming down like that. And that is what I remember her doing, is tatting. Uh, but that's, I don't remember what she, how she did it, I don't remember anything more about it, but some people in the museum in La Crosse will show you how to tat. Certain times of the year they have a show about it. And it's just tiny, tiny needlework. Because in those days, and I'm probably digressing a whole lot, um, people used a lot of lace and a lot of funny um, things that they had for their dresses, because dresses didn't come made. They didn't come on a rack. They didn't, um, you, you couldn't go out and buy much of any kind of a dress. You might mail order catalog it from Sears, but you, you couldn't go, go buy a dress so, uh, that you really wanted to wear. So there were dressmakers all over town. Mary Estelle might have been a dressmaker, but I think she was more apt to do the fine work that people might want to have and buy at the women's exchange because this is what she could do. And I started out talking about the women's exchange. But um, they would bring in things that they had done and uh, from all over La Crosse. And they were for sale or just um, uh, exchange. They started about um, these women, uh, how many, 54 or 50 some of them, uh, started by each putting in two dollars, and the two dollars got them uh, a uh, membership. Now you may have read about this in uh, the article that Margaret Larson wrote in this, in this magazine. But anyway, she was a member of that, and this is the kind of thing she would have, have done. She might have put two pieces together, two pieces of lace together, and you see they, now I'll show you again how this, this would have gone here in a dress that was slit to here, you know, was, would have wrapped maybe, or would have had a big scoop neck. And they were very modest in those days, so it would, it would have stayed up here because it had, it had um, snaps, <laughs> it didn't have, and they would have snapped it on somewhere, and something like that. Now, <clears throat> shall I digress, or do you want to ask me more questions? Well, you can keep going if you want to. Okay. Um, I'll think again about La Crosse in those days. Here's a picture in 1887 of La Crosse, and you probably have that because that's in Margaret's article. Yeah. And it's a pretty well um, thing, but the streets were made of wooden planks down there. And you can see at the bottom of the picture, at least you can in this one, you know, I guess you, how they plank down onto the street mm -hmm. so that when ladies had longer dresses, they, they could go right down, it's right about there, right, as the picture ends there. You can see more of the plank here, maybe. Oh, I see. And so um, that, the ladies had long dresses, so, and they, uh, the streets were muddy and all that kind of thing, so they would scoop up their skirts and step up and so forth. So um, it was uh, that kind of a life for every day. Um, this exchange was first in the lacrosse club, where they met to gather it together, and that building is no longer there. These buildings have all disappeared one way or another with some kind of urban renewal or whatever. Um, people did this kind of thing for the women's exchange. Someone who could knit just sat there and knit, did her knitting, and these were used as, you can make them floppy, and they can be used as face cloths. And they could embroider around the edge with crochet hook, and you could put little lace things on there with a little crocheting. And they, they didn't have washcloths. I mean, the, these were face cloths. Now, if you come with thicker yarn or string, you can make a dish, dish cloth out of them. So 
This is not an old one. This is a new one that someone made for me. Um, where are we going now? Uh, more about the auditorium. Why do you think she did that? I really wonder. Um, there's a story, and I think it's pretty true, that she had imagined that she was giving a real auditorium with red velvet seats and and a uh, you know carpeted and, and big velvet curtains and lighting and you know really something because that was a lot of money in the days that she planned all this and I th the story is that she probably would be rolling over in her grave when she saw the auditorium that was finally built in her name. Now that's the first auditorium. Because it wasn't an auditorium with red velvet seats, it was a arena for basketball. And there was a stage at one end, and you guys are too young to remember that, but it, it was, a, was the auditorium in La Crosse. I mean, people came and, and um, that was the one we had. We had Elvis Presley and we had... Um, Blue Oyster Club, yeah. uh, cult. And I think, yeah, oh, who else was in there? Van Halen. Yeah, sure, probably. And um, a lot of people came and spoke there, like President Ford. And um, oh, I just, just that was where everything went on in lacrosse. So, um, but was it, was it wonderful? Was it, it was wonderful for basketball. Yeah. But would Mary E. have ever thought that she was going to give money for a basketball arena? Yeah. Never. So um, that's why we say that she would probably be rolling over in her grave if she knew what happened. Now, she might be more pleased with the new auditorium, uh, which has her name still is still there above the door as you go down into the auditorium. And I think she would be more pleased with that, but it still is not an auditorium that she thought that she was giving to the city. So I don't know, I never, I don't know anyone living right now who ever talked to her about her gift. There is no one that I can find. I started to research and see if I could find anyone who remembered her. And only my cousin remembered that she lived two doors away and that she didn't put her lights on at night because as she got older, she became more and more frugal and more and more of a recluse. She, but I should start with when she's young, too, that <clears throat> there are stories, there's a wonderful story about she and her husband uh, rented a trolley car. And they had a trolley car party, which seems to have been the rage. And this is back in, um, um, geez, I have the right date here somewhere. Um, they invited all their friends, and they had a hoopla party. They went from about the center of La Crosse south then to Unalaska, and then over to, over to um, the trolley car barn. And um, let's see, that was in 1895. 30 guests. Well, I can hardly imagine anything like that. Can you imagine what the people thought in town? Here's this hoopla party going down the street with a train. <laughs> well, so she must have had fun. And she must have had a, a, a wonderful husband. <clears throat> um, they started out in, she was born in Portage, they started out in Milwaukee, living together and, and were married, and then um, he inherited the Sawyer uh, Lumber Company, Sawyer Austin Lumber Company, and came back to La Crosse to run it. So he came back as a pretty important man with a big job, and they were cutting down trees all around here, so it was quite local. Um, then uh, they had a party in 1896. This is all in the little book about La Crosse. Um, and it was called the Germania Hall Party. And the women did all the duties, usually done by men. Inviting, hiring hacks, buying corsages. Men in costume carried flowers. Um, William, that's William E. Sawyer, her husband, wore white, a white hair pompadour, an empire costume. He was dressed as a woman, a red sash, and he had some lace on his costume. 
So and then did, went on to describe what the other men wore. They must have had an absolutely wonderful time. And they, in those days, I think they all created their own times. There weren't movies and the, the whole lot of theater. There was theater, but not a whole lot. I think they made more, made more fun by themselves and, and things like charades and that kind of thing. So um, let's see, where were we? Oh, as she got, as she was older, and her husband died so early. He died before 1900. He only was like 40 something. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So he died so much earlier, and she went on living as a single woman alone. Upstairs on 14th and King Street was where I knew her. And so, and as she grew older, she very rarely went out, only when invited to a special party or something special. And her friends became fewer and fewer, and she became what I think was probably very reclusive. Um, when I went to see her, that would have been in the 30s, I took her a Christmas present every year. And that was one of the things my mother said to me, is, Mrs. Sawyer is your godmother, and you, take, you make something and take it to her. So I started knitting washcloths and embroidering dish towels. And trying to find things that I knew how to do that she might like or even appreciate or anything at all. So that was um, every Christmas time for, oh, let's say five years. We even took her cinnamon suckers one time. I can't imagine that, but we made, my mother and I made a whole lot of cinnamon suckers for, I, I don't know, it was part of Christmas. And we took them to Mrs. Sawyer. And she received me. I walked up those steps and they were sort of dark and there, she didn't ever come to see me, so she may have not been very easy on her feet at that time. I would walk into her parlor, and she would say, how do you do? And I would say, Merry Christmas, Mrs. Sawyer, and hand her the towel and get out as fast as I could. <laughs> so <clears throat> as far as um, I, uh, that all goes, uh, I think um, I didn't know her. I didn't know her when she was at her best. Mm -hmm. I only knew her as a much older lady and um, probably hurting and tucked away in an upstairs apartment with terrible stairs. Two things I want you to know, though. She gave me, when I was two years old, an emerald ring, which I wore today, <coughs> which was a big deal. And my mother put it away until I was 16. Then I was allowed to wear it only at very special, special occasions. occasions. And I didn't get the habit till after I was out of college. So she, my mother <laughs> probably thought I was not going to be able to hang on to it. So, um, so I still have it, and I love it, and it's pretty dressy just to wear around, so I only wear it for special occasions. But it is an emerald surrounded by diamonds in a square cut, and I think it's a beautiful ring. And just aside, when my father, my mother gave it to me, when I really should have had, should have it, my father bought her one, bought my mother a ring very much like it. So the other thing I brought is this lace. Mary Sawyer loves lace. Are we running out of time? No. Nope, I can go on, on, you know, for quite a But can I stop quick just to see? We're back to lace. Um, and tatting and so forth. I brought some pieces with me that you're going to scan into something. And the reason I think she made these pieces is because they have strings attached, where she might have taken that, it might have been part of something that she was making, and she didn't know how far she had to go, so she, um, she would attach strings, um, I mean, she wouldn't cut them off, she'd make it so she could attach it to something. I just, I don't know. But these she might have done. This you can see is old fashioned crocheting. And she could have done that. I mean, I don't know that she did this. <laughs> but that's the type of thing that was done in those days because every dress had lace on it. Every, almost every dress had some kind of a lace here, a lace here, lace here, lace cuffs, lace, all sorts of things. So. And then when she finished it, she might put it on a spool like that. 
Now, I don't know if this, I don't think this is hers. I don't know why it was in this box that I had. But maybe it's how they kept lace. It's a num wonderful old school. And um, so I just kept that. How long does it usually take to make I one of these? I have no idea. Yeah. I think it would take a long time. Yeah. It must be very fussy work. Mm -hmm. So do you think her personality is a very calm lady? Very good question. Um, I think certainly in the later years it was. Uh -huh. I think she might have been a very fastidious, you know, very careful, very perfect in the things that she did, um, taking tiny stitches, moving with little things, and I think she might have been quite fastidious. And I think she could, I don't think she did this though. I'm now looking at it, I think this is just, but you see what they, the people did, oh, this is very silly, I brought this along because I don't know quite what it is or how it works. But it must have been some kind of a brassiere. No, it must have been... It had been in the top to a dress. It could have been. And then I think what happened was you could tuck this down in your underpants and it would hold it all in place. I can't figure out <laughs> what that is. <laughs> but I thought it was kind of weird, and, but it just goes to show uh, what they did with lace. Uh, how do you think uh, she paved the way for some future women? Oh, maybe she did something great in her being a philanthropist. She, she had money. She managed it well. She made sure that she um, uh, had enough to live on and put some away. Now she perhaps did this to to too great an extent, I don't know. But she did manage, or had somebody manage. We were still trying to figure out who might have done that, and somebody at the La Crosse Trust Company is trying to find that out for me. But somehow she managed her money very well, and she gave it back to the city. She didn't give it to, um, I don't know, she just gave it back for something better in the city. And that, I think, is maybe, that's sort of forgotten, but it's, something that's important. And that, that's her biggest, I think, gift. Now I have on, I don't always wear black, but I wore it today, <laughs> that's right, I never do. But I wore this today so the lace would show up because this is a kind of a jacket that they might have worn in uh, the late 1800s. You, you see, it, it, it's all handmade. It's, it fits without a, without a seam. That must take a lot of time. Can you think of doing that? So therefore, I think it is, it's, it's European. I, I can't, and this is, looks like Irish lace here. So um, in, a, in part of it, I don't know, but it's sewing together all kinds of little um, medallion things, but making a whole jacket out of it. And um, I, I inherited this somehow. And um, I thought this is about the only thing, this in the ring of hers, that I really have. There's a painting um, that my brother has, and I was going to bring it. I went over to get it, and it's in a huge gold frame. I could not have managed to get it in the car, so I didn't bring it. But that's a painting, an Italian painting, um, Italian artist. And it is not oil, it's some other kind of medium. We couldn't figure it out this morning. And um, interestingly enough, it is a painting of a woman who is spinning with a spinning wheel. And you know, just seeing that made me start to think of these times I went to see Mrs. Sawyer in her apartment, and I think I remember there was a spinning wheel up there. Uh, she had an apartment on the south, with south windows, and I think she did have a spinning wheel there. And it would be fun to think of her spinning um, and getting this painting of the woman spinning in Italy. And um, so I think I'm, I'm, I have no more things to show you. I think that's the end of my show. What other questions do you have? Uh, 
what were some daily chores that women did in the 1930s? Uh, well, of course, all the chores of every housewife ever did with um, scratch, but I don't think Mary E. Sawyer did any um, after her husband died. I don't think she did chores. I think she had a maid. She had a maid all the time I knew her. Now, earlier she may have done her own work. I just haven't got a clue. We know so little about her. Do you know what her husband was like? Not at all, but he must have loved fun. Yeah. And the last three years of his life he spent in Arkansas trying to get another lumber mill going down there. So he spent traveling back and forth um, to manage a lumbering <coughs> business. So, but I don't know what he was like at all. Yeah. There, the times, we, I don't, it's hard to imagine how they must have lived because things must have taken so long to do and uh, uh, with minimal um, modern conveniences. It must have taken forever to, to just live your life. Just imagine washing sheets or sending them out and having them done. Imagine ironing everything. Imagine no dry cleaners. Imagine spotting wool or velvet or lace. I mean, most of the lace I have is a little bit spotted here and there. And, and how to get anything clean. We didn't have the soaps. They made soaps out of lye and um, fat and lard and I don't know how. But anyhow, and then they, well, I do know that to make it smell nice, they would take a, their own perfume, old bottle of perfume, and keep it by the laundry and where they made the lye soap <clears throat> and put little drops of perfume into this vat of soap that they were making, and then they'd make it into bars, you know, make it a big flat, and then they cut it into bars. But it smelled nice because they used a little bit of perfume in it. But think of that. Um, think of what it... Refrigeration was... had some, of course, but it was a block of ice block brought in. And um, so if she did her own housework, it probably took quite a bit of time. But I have a feeling she was... In those days, people did have help, and she probably had help when she was, as she grew older. Um, I, as I knew her, she always had help. <clears throat> in fact, the maid came down the stairs and opened the door so that I could come in. So I knew that there was someone else there. What was she usually <clears throat> doing when you'd go visit her? She was sitting upstairs in her sitting room. Mm -hmm. you know, it was a love. It was a nice room, um, not comfy and cozy so much as bright, as nice light. And she looked down on the house next door, which had a nice garden and yard. And so um, that was what she was doing most of the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, I, I didn't, I didn't know her as a person. Yeah. I only knew her very, very slightly. And I, I try to put things together about her, and as I think about her. But it's uh, only conjecture. Yeah. Know her pretty well at all? Good question. No, she didn't. My mother came to La Crosse in 1926, and um, she was an, a stranger. She came from Buffalo, New York. <clears throat> so it was my father who might have known Mary Sawyer pretty well, and my and an uncle of mine who may or may not have been part of the trust company that held Mrs. Sawyer's trust. He may, he may have known, um, been part of that. I, had, I just couldn't tell you. But they, we knew her, um, all of us, because she was part of a neighborhood. <clears throat> and um, in the, we all lived within a block of each other. My uncle, my grandmother, myself, and Mrs. Sawyer. So we, um, and so we did, she was part of a neighborhood, but as I say again, she didn't go out walking, she didn't go out driving, she didn't, we didn't see her, and therefore I, she made very little impact as a person on my life, you know. But as I think about her and, and the fact that she gave all that money to the city for an auditorium, must have meant that she had, had some 
real thoughts about what a city needs. You know, what, what does a city need to be a city? To, and I think she thought we needed some um, entertainment maybe and some culture maybe. Who is to know? Yeah. 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 Yeah.